Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day and welcome. Thanks for joining us for a very special celebration of women at Wentworth and empowering women through leadership and innovation. My name is Ryan Rogers and I am a proud scientist and a professor here at Wentworth in the Department of Sciences. Over the, oh. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I have the honor and privilege of supporting young women here by encouraging them to pursue their passion. Not my passion in science, but if they like that, it's fine. Um, but I think it's really important for us as females and males as well to encourage students to pursue what they like. And it's my honor every day to meet these excited young people and learn from them as I try to at least make them like a little bit what I'm trying to communicate in the classroom and in the lab. Anyway, I am happy to facilitate another example here of Wentworth's dedication to women, to young minds, and to the future of STEM overall. Each year, these gatherings bring together alumni, students, faculty, staff, and friends in the areas of science, design, engineering, construction, technology, management, and I'm sure many other fields. Here, contacts are made, ideas exchanged, and bonds are strengthened. With the Women of the Year Award, we honor an individual who works to promote the vision and mission of Wentworth while making significant contributions to her industry and the community. Through professional or volunteer work, the Woman of the Year exhibits leadership, service, commitment, achievement, and an outstanding character. Among our special guests today, we're pleased to have with us Wentworth's Woman of the Year for 2018, Helen Grainer, co-founder of iRobot and founder of Sci-Fi Works, a leading drone company delivering aerial platforms to defense, security, public safety, and commercial markets. We'll be hearing more from Helen later on in our program, but for now, let me say that it's wonderful to have her here with us today. I know that I speak for many of us in saying that we admire and respect you for your hard-won career success and impressive record of service in the name of innovation and entrepreneurship. Thank you for raising the bar and serving as a role model in the field. The program organizers also want to offer a special welcome and recognition to J. Dorenzo Company and Consigli Construction Company, two major sponsors of today's Women at Wentworth gathering. We congratulate and thank Consigli Construction Company for its enduring commitment to this university, which includes helping to establish the Women at Wentworth Endowed Scholarship Fund. This morning, we're also recognizing the many groups and organizations that are led by female-identified students at Wentworth. And I must say, I'm proud to note that I've had many of them come through my classroom, and they are so special and so wonderful. So I consider myself very lucky in that sense. We rely on these young women to help foster and sustain the support of other women on campus, across the Wentworth community at large, and throughout their respective local and national organizations. I'm going to ask if these representatives would please stand and remain standing while I read your names. For everyone in the audience, all the proud friends, family, colleagues, please hold your applause. I know it's going to be difficult because they're very special, but that would really help them have their moment. So, once again, when I say your name, please stand and remain standing, and we'll do a nice big roaring round of applause to recognize them at the end. So, our first student is Dahlia Al Muharab from WIT UNICEF. I get it, I get it. <laughs> Jasmine Andrade from Cape Verdean Student Association. Claudia Kobani from Mobile Application Development and Design. Kelsey DeGavea from American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Roanne Elzadig from Islamic Society at WIT. Abigail Fowler from Wentworth Architecture Club. Anna Hall from Construction Management Club. Paige Huntress from Wentworth Design Collaborative. Monica Ingalls from Society of Women Engineers. Meredith Jamicki from Wentworth Women's Rugby. Shivani Coomer from Student Alumni Society. Linnell LaRousse from Cosplay. Fran Nunez from the Veterans Club. Grace O'Connell from Women's Integrated Task Force, 
Sabrina Prosciutto from Society of Manufacturing Engineers, Angela Pikert from Women's Integrated Task Force, Kiara Pearson from Student Association of Interior Design, Jessica Powers from Student Association of Management, Megan Rayner from National Association of Home Builders, Ali Rishmani from Women's Institute for Leadership Development, Katie Schlosser from Student Association of Management, Megan Serafin from Student Association for Biomedical Sciences, Jill Senko from Biomedical Engineers Society, Siobhan Turner from National Society of Black Engineers, and Alyssa Valise from Wentworth Robotics Club. Now let's give them that round of applause. Thank you all very much for all that you do at Wentworth. I'm genuinely excited to see how you choose to apply your leadership roles in the future in your respective fields and beyond. Now, before I turn the program over to President Zaritza Pontich, I want to invite Carrie Reynolds of the Division of Institutional Advancement to come up and tell us about the newly formed Women's Council, an exciting initiative on campus that builds upon existing programs for young women at the Institute. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. As Professor Rogers said, my name is Carrie Reynolds. I work in the Alumni Relations Department here at Wentworth. But today I have the honor of speaking to you on behalf of the Wentworth Women's Council. The Wentworth Women's Council started this spring as a way to coordinate, establish, and support efforts to improve the women's experience at Wentworth, working alongside various departments across campus and all the amazing women student organizations and clubs. One of the first tasks that our council um, had was to come up with our mission statement, and we're proud to share that um, with you today. So um, our mission is to use our roots to further inspire, involve, and empower students and alumni to create a safe space for women's voices within the Wentworth community. This mission was established by the founding members of the Women's Council. I'm gonna, again, ask each of these fabulous young women to stand, and I'll ask you to just hold your applause until the end. So, Gabby Borganovo, she's un unfortunately not here with us today. Olivia DeLuca, Rowan Elsedig, Brooke Ensby, Taylor Frothingham, Fatima Hussein, Anne Hun, and Christina Zanino. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you, ladies. And before I leave you here today, I just want to acknowledge um, being in this room full of so many powerful female leaders here on this campus. It's not lost on me what an honor it is to be the advisor for this group. Um, we've only had a few meetings so far, and everyone, I'm just blown away with the energy in the room and the passion that these young women bring. So stay tuned because they're going to do some amazing things with all of your support, and we're all on the same team, so we'll all get to share in that. Um, please feel free to come up and introduce yourself to me or any of the council members if you want to learn more, and thank you. Thank you, Carrie. That's very exciting news. I hope to get involved as well in the future, and I'm sure many other faculty, staff on campus will join as well. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to turn the microphone over to a woman who needs no introduction, but we're going to do a little one anyway. She is someone who has been with us for over 13 years, helped drive, develop, and refine the mission and vision for Wentworth as a whole. She's an exceptional role model, and she is known here, there, and everywhere. So please, let's welcome President Zaritza Pontich. Thank you, Ryan. It's such a great pleasure to be with all you here today. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many women and a few good men who came to support us. So let's give everybody a big round of applause. We have a terrific program to share with you. And of course, welcome Helen. And I want to thank her personally for being here with us 
as a, such a great role model in accepting to be our Woman of the Year. Uh, and uh, your career is really something that is inspirational, not only to the students, but to me also personally. And I'm very much looking forward to presenting your award in just a few minutes. Let's give her a big round of applause once again. Thank you for being with us. I also would like to thank Jade Derenzo Company and Consigli Construction Company for their support, which means so much to the university and our students. And it has been my honor and privilege to preside for so many years over the Women at Vanford program. As you know, uh, we had the first women come in in 1972, uh, just five of them. And now we have 20% of female students and continue to increase that number. And the recent programs that we have started, such as biomedical engineering or biological engineering, have a large percentage of female students, which will help us to continue to increase the per percentage and participation. But uh, as I said, we have 20% female students at Wentford, but that's just a number that does not describe well how fearless and great leaders our students are. And they are uh, in the 50% of all leadership positions here at Wentford. And the uh, biggest award that goes for leadership, the Wentford Ball, has been awarded 80% of the time to female students. So again, they are trailblazers, fearless leaders. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. And of course, our faculty are amazing here with us that support uh, uh, students every step of the way. We have great staff that is here to help students not only outside of the classroom but any other way that they need support. We want to make sure that they are prepared for whatever challenges they have uh, ahead of them here at Wentworth but also when they go outside for their co-ops or when they graduate and become productive members of our society because the disciplines that we have here, engineering, design, management, and sciences, have a great positive impact on the societies and improve students' lives. So you are actually changing the lives of the people for the better. And I want again to thank our uh, faculty and staff. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. And of course, uh, we had a great leadership from our uh, board and our uh, corporators who helped Wentworth become a leader in engineering design, uh, management, and sciences education. And we have here our trustee, Steve Husey. We have from the corporators, Di Norm Dinah, and we also have Rose Canty. Let's give them a big round of applause. And I would also like to recognize our alumni association that has done so much to help me being a president who moved this institution forward. So would you please stand up and let's give them all a big round of applause. Thank you so much. So again, it's wonderful to be with all you here today but most importantly, it is all about students because we always say that students come first at Wentford. So would you please, all students who are recognized for your leadership, could you please stand up once again and let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Pontich. Speaking of Consigli Construction Company, let's turn our attention now to some exciting news about the very first recipient of the Women at Wentworth Endowed Scholarship. For that, I want to introduce Janine Kovitz, BCMT 2004. Janine is a project manager for Consigli and a member of the Wentworth Alumni Association. Let's welcome Janine to the stage. Thank you, Ryan, and good morning, everybody. 
I am very proud and excited to be back on campus today as a member of the class of 2004 and to represent Consigli Construction, a building industry leader headquartered in Milford, Massachusetts. At last year's Women at Wentworth event, Consigli announced a $100,000 contribution to Wentworth to help transform the library into the Douglas D. Schumann Library and Learning Commons to support students through sponsorship of industry, sorry, university events, and importantly, to launch the Women at Wentworth Endowed Scholarship Fund. The scholarship is awarded annually to one or two female juniors or seniors who demonstrate academic excellence and leadership on campus. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce you to the first winner of this scholarship, Cassidy Duquette, Facilities Planning Management Class of 2018. Cassidy? Hello and good morning everyone. Let me first and foremost offer my thanks to the contributors to the scholarship fund, Consigli Construction Company, and say that I am truly honored to be the first recipient of the Woman at Wentworth Endowed Scholarship. When I found out I was awarded this scholarship, I felt an overwhelming sense of appreciation. I have been fortunate enough to receive a number of scholarships since my freshman year, but this one is particularly special. For those of you that don't know, Wentworth has a male to female ratio of approximately 80 to 20%. But the percentage of women on campus is slowly and steadily increasing. I am proud to be among the women at Wentworth. Before 1972, when the board voted to make the university co-educational, there were no female students on campus. Now, in 2018, there are around 1,000 female students on campus. And there are a lot of women in leadership positions at this institute, including our president, our dean of students, and so many professors who guide Wentworth students through their educational careers every day. We are finally at a point in time where society is slowly but surely shifting to gender equality, inspiring a rise in mutual respect among men and women. This shift starts with the younger generations. It starts with those who are finding their voices, and those who are allowed to think on their own, and those who are optimistic enough to drive that change in society. It starts with us, the generation of students on college campuses, and Wentworth is one of those universities that allows its students to lead that shift. I remember being a freshman and walking into my first class. It was building construction, and I was one of only two females. It was terrifying, honestly. Not terrifying in a way that made me feel unsafe, but it was terrifying because I was nervous to find my voice in that class. I was unsure if I would have the same respect as my male peers. Now that I am a senior, and yes, I am still only one of two females in those classes, I don't feel that fear anymore. I walk into my classes now with so much pride and strength to be one of the only females in those classes. I have been able to find my voice, and receiving this scholarship has helped me develop that voice. It's no secret that the female population in STEM and construction careers is low, but Wentworth is changing that with the opportunities and the programs that it offers to its students. Scholarship opportunities like this one will attract female students who want to make a change in society, and it will help build hope and confidence in the female students who already attend Wentworth. It is essential that women surround themselves with other women now more than ever, and I feel overwhelmingly privileged to be among the women at Wentworth. Thank you again for choosing me to receive the Woman at Wentworth Scholarship and speak with you today on behalf of current and future female students at Wentworth. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you very much, Cassidy. That was a wonderful speech. And thank you, Janine and Consigli Construction Company as well for this wonderful opportunity for Cassidy and future females. Now, this is the part we've all been waiting for. Let me tell you a little bit more about today's guest of honor. In a word, our Woman of the Year honoree for 2018 is amazing. For so many reasons, Helen Grainer is a perfect choice for this recognition. 
She's known for her boundless innovative spirit and exceptional business strategy in the field of robotics, both of which have made her extremely successful. She's the founder of Sci-Fi Works, a leading drone company delivering aerial platforms to defense, security, public safety, and commercial markets. She co-founded iRobot in 1990 and served as president until 2004 excuse me, and chairman until 2008. During her tenure, she guided iRobot into its position as a global leader with the release of the Roomba and SUGV military robots. She built a culture of practical innovation and delivery that led to the deployment of more than 6,000 tactical robots with our troops and more than 15 million home robots worldwide. In addition, Helen led iRobot's financing efforts, raising 35 million in venture capital for a 75 million initial public offering. Her accolades are too numerous to list in total, but let me just mention a few of them. Helen is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, which has recognized her for leadership in the design, development, and application of practical robots. She's been named one of America's best leaders by the Harvard Kennedy School in conjunction with US News and World Report. She was also recognized as an innovator for the next century by the Review Magazine, and as a global leader of tomorrow and young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Ernst & Young named her New England Entrepreneur of the Year, and she's been inducted into the Women in Technology International Hall of Fame. Th that list goes on, and that's just her professional list. With respect to service, it includes working from 2014 to 2017 as a presidential advisor for global entrepreneurship for President Obama and the Secretary of Commerce. She's a trustee of the board of the Boston Museum of Science, a former trustee at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a past president of the Robotics Technology Consortium. Helen holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in computer science, both from MIT. She also holds honorary degrees from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and Clarkson University. Now please join me in welcoming Helen to the stage, and congratulations. Helen, it is my honor and privilege to present with the 2018 Vanford Woman of the Year Award in recognition of your leadership and community spirit, your overall commitment to excellence, your professional achievement, and contributions to society in general. Congratulations. Wow, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm going to send it right up here. <laughs> um, uh, I'm really honored to be here. It's a very unexpected um, thrill. And um, I'm also honored to be asked to say a few words today uh, based on my um, very long now e experiences. It was so much fun when I used to be the 23 year old speaking in, in, in a room and be the youngest person in the audience, <laughs> I mean, on, on the stage, uh, but, but now I'm not. Um, I'd like to talk today about pursuing your passion. Um, one thing that really led me to the, you know, quite frankly, dream career that I've had is it's always been my passion, not just my job. And when you pursue your passion, every day you get up and it's not just a job you go to, it really is something you want to get up and, uh, and, and do with your life. Um, so I was inspired um, in 1977, I saw Star Wars on the big screen, and I wasn't like, um, uh, I wasn't infatuated with Han Solo or Luke Skywalker. It was really all about R2-D2, uh, because R2-D2, he was, had a personality, he had an agenda, he saved the universe, and he was really just more than a machine. And so I've always been inspired to build things that are machines, obviously, but are more than machines. Um, so R2-D2 has been my muse. Um, I chose to go to MIT. I'm not sure the reasons why, but um, uh, this picture is actually from a hack that um, the students did making the Great Dome into R2-D2. Um, but 
really, like at Wentworth, it's a place where you can meet similarly minded people and really your inspiration can build off each other. Um, you know, I, I can honestly say to the women in this audience, I didn't meet a lot of women in high school that, I mean, they were very, very um, nice, they were very ambitious, et cetera, but I didn't find a lot of them had the same interests as I did. But when I went to a, um, a university like this, I all of a sudden I, I could say, hey, these are my people, <laughs> you know, these are my peeps. <laughs> and I think a lot of you are having that same experience and it's really um, wonderful. I uh, had the good fortune to uh, co-found iRobot um, in 1990. Uh, yes, iRobot has been around that long. Uh, we got off to a little slow start, which I will tell you a little bit about, not, not too much because of time, time today. Um, but when we started, the robots we were building got a lot of attention, right? Um, we were so thrilled. Can you imagine you're just in your early 20s and your robots are making the covers of all these wonderful magazines? You're like, we must be hitting the nail on the head. We must be going somewhere. The problem is, and this is like uh, something I really want to stress to you guys, um, I call it don't drink your own Kool-Aid. <laughs> um, you really want to be, like the press will, wants to have a story. They want to write about something new and original and, and stuff. And I'm not sure what our goal was to corner the market on robot insects um, as, as a company. At, at a university, it's very different as you're pursuing research for 20, 50 years out of the company. You have to be a little closer, um, uh, you know, your site's a little closer to get to revenues and uh, profits. <laughs> um, so we were building all these wonderful things. They were getting wonderful attention and it got us started. But it wasn't until we um, stopped kind of listening to the press and other people and really focused on the business of robotics that we had uh, the kind of success that we had. And this is a chart of our success. Um, I actually stepped down from being chairman and president of iRobot in 2008. The chart keeps on going up and up and up. I think it's $880 million of revenue last year, um, mostly for sales of home, home robots. And, um, but this is the chart over time. And you can see we started very, very modestly in, uh, in, in this is a chart of revenues. You can barely see the revenues on, on this chart. And we had this idea, maybe we would build these six-legged walking robots and send them to, 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 to space. Um, <laughs> and it sounds a little far-fetched now, but you know, it's coming back. You know, Elon Musk is making a good uh, show of uh, getting things going in, in space. Uh, but it really wasn't a good business plan. It wasn't like, we didn't sit down and build a business plan, which I highly recommend. Even though this worked for us, it took us a heck of a long time to do it. <laughs> um, but along the way, we were building these great robots. We'd send them to research labs, and the researchers, they were very forgiving. If we, put, if we had the value of a resistor wrong, they could, you know, they could take a soldering iron and change it themselves, which was great when you get started. And then we did some work for law enforcement. Then we did some more military research, because the military also said, hey, what about these small little swarms of robots? Uh, then we did um, commercial cleaning, downhole oil tools. We did so many different robots, and we were always growing a little bit. So we always thought we were doing well. We always thought the, the thing we were working on would be the next big thing, and it never was. <laughs> um, one example is we built uh, a, a commercial cleaning device, and we got it, we built the prototype, and then they told us, well, we don't really want that to be autonomous. We want it to be a push-behind cleaner. So we built a push-behind cleaner that was much like any other cleaner with a little robotic technology, and it didn't go very far. Um, but we were always getting um, more and more experience, and so we didn't look at any of these as failures. Like, if something doesn't work out, you really just got to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and be going on to the, to the next thing. For us, it's all about robotics, so it's good to stay true to your vision, but you have to modify along the way. If, uh, if you're being told by the market that's not exactly what the right thing is. Um, it wasn't until we put the Moomba on the market in 2002, we started development of it at the end of uh, 1998, it wasn't until we got that on the market that um, uh, we, you know, we had the success. At the same exact time, our military robots were deployed in Afghanistan uh, helping defeat bombs, and that was taking off in a big way too. So sometimes people ask me which came first, the Roomba or the military robots? And I don't think, 
I don't think they could have gone in sequence because if you're having so much success on one thing, it would be hard to start another thing. They just hit at exactly the same time. Um, so 2002 was a really, really interesting year. <laughs> uh, just a little story about one of the devices. So this is the, the toy that we did with Hasbro. It's one of the things that, you know, quite frankly, it didn't succeed. And what we had done was we, we, you saw the picture I showed of the robot on the cover of National Geographic. It, you know, we got a lot of attention for that, and we parlayed that into a contract with Hasbro, a leading toy manufacturer. And our thought was, well, um, we'll make it really low cost. We'll make it for $200 of parts, because the robots we were selling cost like $10,000, right? Because we were selling them to high-end research labs and um, military contracts. And um, so we built it, we put like a lot of effort into, you know, the, the motors in there, there's only one motor controlling all the facial expressions and it could go from happy, sad, crying and everything. It had a, 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 mood, um, uh, a, a mood system and an emotion system uh, installed inside. And we took it to Hasbro and they're like, $200 of parts, that'll never be a toy. And you know, so that crushed us. Um, but we worked with them, we learned from them we learned from the toy engineers and got the parts down to what could be a consumer price point. And um, we got it down to be uh, on the market for like $99. We put it on the market, got a lot of great press on it, and then nobody bought it. <laughs> and, you know, we, we had put our hearts and souls into, into it. And um, it was a... Uh, uh, some people says it looked like Chucky, by the way, which may be why it didn't sell. But another reason is we were depending on the uh, toy, toy industry um, to do what we, we considered. We would bring the robotics, the technology. They would bring you know, the market expertise, the knowledge of toys, the advertising, and media. And what we discovered was um, you know, they, they, they had that, all that set up, but they had it set up for any toy, not a new kind of a toy. And so it really didn't um, go anywhere. Uh, but what happened, we learned from it. We learned how to get things manufactured in the Far East. We learned how to um, keep to a cost target as not just one design criterion, but the design criterion, right? Everything else can go, <laughs> but you are keeping it to the, to the cost target. We didn't have that kind of discipline before. So um, instead of saying, okay, that didn't work out, we learned from it and we could move on to the next thing with that um, experience of how to do it the correct way from, from the beginning. So we put, um, started developing Roomba. We started raising venture capital in, in 1998. Started Roomba development, I think it was 1999. We put it on the market in 2002. And uh, I have to say about the development, one thing I've learned along the way, you know, you can either, you, small groups with passion are what really get things done. So if you can organize your company or your, um, your club with around small groups that are really dedicated to that one thing that's really going to get you um, where you need to go. And it's such a great experience to be either leading one of those groups or to be part of one of those groups. Um, because who, who doesn't want to like get something earth shattering done? I think it was Margaret Mead who said, um, small groups with passion can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever does. Um, she was talking more on the social, anthropological side. I think small engineering groups are what really drives technology um, forward. Now, you'll notice one thing about this picture in, in this group of women, that there are no women there. <laughs> uh, she, she didn't make the picture, but this is Clara. Uh, we used to do everything on our own. Um, uh, Clara's a math major from, from Yale, who's also a top-notch engineer. Her hobby is ballroom dancing, so the first advertisement we made for Roomba by ourselves <laughs> featured um, one of our design engineers. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, Clara, after I robot, went on to found Harvest Automation. I don't think that one worked out. Now she's gone on to co-found another company called Veo. They just raised a lot of venture capital, and I think it's going to be um, very successful for her. So, um, uh, again, I think based on all those learning experiences that she, she had along the way, and at the same time, I think she keeps pursuing her passion for ballroom dancing. <laughs> Luckily for us at the time. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I do say, like, you know, it wasn't until we started um, uh, really focusing on the other elements of robotics, not just the technical, that we had success at, at iRobot. And I think this, um, you know, this story illustrates that. We asked our engineers what we should call the Roomba, and uh, some of them answered Rosie. Some of them answered uh, the Cyber Suck. <laughs> Honey, I brought home a, a Cyber Suck. <laughs> the mind boggles. Uh, the Durdenator, and my, my favorite was the um, Mugmaster 2000. Um, but what we did um, after we didn't choose one of these names was we hired a professional branding agency, and it was literally the best $30,000 we ever spent. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, Luma's gone on to sell, I think, uh, 18 million uh, so far, and I, I, I truly believe that it is a better way to get the everyday vacuuming done uh, automatically. Uh, at the same time, our military robots, we've been developing them. Um, World Trade Center hit. The robots, we took them down there the first day. Uh, we were down at the World Trade Center with these, these robots. And then soon after, the military started what they called the Rapid Equipping Force, and we were the number one um, uh, piece of equipment, new piece of equipment that they fielded with this new Pentagon or organization. When we were doing the research for it, we decided, oh, I had been to a special forces training exercise and they told me, oh, these robots are great, but you know, you have to like handle them with kid gloves. We're going to throw them out the back of a C-130. If they can't climb stairs, if they can't go into a hangar, if they can't look for things and, oh, if they've fallen and I can't get up, we can't use them. So we really concentrate on making a robot that's really tough. And when I used to play this video back in the 90s, um, I used to get applause, right? Because well, no one had ever seen a robot like it that was so tough that it could withstand the kind of abuse that they would give. This product is still going strong. It's still used by military law enforcement all around the, the world to um, defeat explosive devices. It was used in uh, Fukushima. It was used uh, when we had that Boston Marathon terrorist that we went up to the core to make sure that it um, didn't have any uh, explosives rigged to it. And I, I love to see them in, in, in the news still. This is how they uh, sometimes come back from operations. This one was carried by a big tough marine into a robot hospital over in, um, over in Iraq and he's like, can you fix it? <laughs> and um, you know, our answer is no, that, that warranty is void. <laughs> um, but, you know, more tellingly, he didn't want any robot, right? He wanted his robot, and it turns out uh, the robot's name was Scooby-Doo. Um, it had done so many uh, improvised explosive device missions, vehicle-borne device um, uh, missions, and he considered it one of the team. And he didn't want just any old robot, he wanted that robot. Um, the story has a nice ending. Um, I did find Scooby-Doo. Um, it was in a robot graveyard in Huntsville. And um, he, he's now um, in a, a resting place in the uh, iRobot Museum. Um, one of the things that I've been most thrilled at in, in my career is um, once I was speaking between two generals at the uh, Army War College, and you know, one had you know, four stars, one had three stars, and I'm like, oh, you know, these colonels are not going to want to hear from me, they're going to want to hear from the generals, but they rushed me at the end of the show, and one of them shook my hand and said, your robot saved 11 of my guys on one mission, here's my coin. So I always carry that coin proudly with me, because it reminds me that the impact um, technology can have uh, uh, people coming home from, from the field.
So um, we had the wonderful opportunity to take iRobot public in 2005. I uh, led that effort. Um, we also got to open the stock market uh, that, that day. And um, we actually turned it down because we thought it would be more appropriate if the PacBot did it. So PacBot became the first robot to open the NASDAQ. <laughs> and um, you can see I'm very happy that day. That was a very good day. <laughs> Uh, and I like to say, just as we planned it 15 years ago. <laughs> um, but on a, more, on, on a serious note, right? You ha it's always good to be flexible in, you stick to your vision, but be flexible in the details of how you get there. But the other note is, if we can pull this off, anybody can do it. So you shouldn't hold back. <laughs> you're going to learn from what you don't know. You're going to learn from your experience. You're going to learn from your mistakes. What's important is you're getting out there and you're doing it. Uh, I will have to say a little about Sci-Fi. Sci-Fi is my, my next company. When I looked at, um, well, how does R2-D2 really get around? He had jetpacks. <laughs> He couldn't get over that terrain. So, you know, what I thought was, you know, drones are kind of a magic technology to get over. If you look around this room, it'd be easy for a drone uh, to come up here, but it'd be hard for a ground robot because he'd have to get around all the chairs and, um, it, you know, everything that's on, on the ground. So I, I want to work on drones. So I, I, I think that one of the things I love to do is learn something new every day. I think if you're learning something new every day, it's not a wasted day. Um, so this is a, a robot we've uh, built at Sci-Fi. It's a tethered robot. It goes up and stays up. It l lasts for 24-7. Um, it flies hundreds of hours at a time routinely. And they use it now at checkpoints and at combat outposts, uh, surveilling an area and extending communications in the field. Since we had a great robot, one of the things we did uh, two years ago was um, I've been thinking about drone delivery with robots. Um, convinced UPS and UPS um, uh, jumped in and we did some uh, field trials for them using our robot, no tether by the way, delivering um, medical equipment to a island off right here off the coast of Massachusetts, um, uh, which was, you know, I do believe that um, drone delivery is going to be a huge application in the future uh, for, um, for drones and robotic delivery of cargo in general. So I would say, um, you know, to summarize, uh, follow your passion. You'll never know where it'll take you. It got me to the Oval Office with Steve Case, um, Chobani, the guy who does the yogurt, uh, Tori Bush, who's a well-known fashion designer. I didn't know that, but now I buy his stuff. <laughs> uh, and uh, these people are not just there because they're entrepreneurs. There's lots of entrepreneurs in the country. I think these people are here because they did something that they're really, really um, passionate about. With uh, uh, Chobani, he's um, uh, helping uh, refugees get their uh, feet uh, planted in, 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 in the country. Um, with Tori Burt, she's really has always set up the company to encourage other women entrepreneurs and empower them. And um, uh, Steve Gase is working more on the policy side. Um, you know, people are really pursuing their, um, their passion. So it was a thrill for me. I never thought I'd get into the Oval Office, especially being, a, you know, an immigrant myself. <laughs> so I'd say uh, pursue your passion. And I did go out and talk to a few Wentworth um, graduates. Um, we hired a lot of them at, at, uh, at iRobot over the years because it's a very hands-on school and it's a very hands-on kind of a company. It needs a lot of practical uh, experience. Uh, uh, Jen, uh, a woman uh, went with graduate, told me, um, you know, I asked what she would tell an audience, and she said, well, sometimes it can be lonely. Like, she was in classes here, and she was the only woman, and, you know, maybe the guys hadn't showered as much as they could, and she was feeling like, maybe I don't belong here. Maybe this isn't what I want to do. Um, but she pushed through it, and she had the opportunity to... Um, build robots at, I, at iRobot to go on military exercises in Thailand with a new kind of um, robot. Um, to, um, that robot went out and helped in Fukushima vacuuming up radiation. Now she's a draper doing things uh, we can't even talk about. And, you know, if you push through, um, uh, it, it, it is changing, right? It, it's changing. It's changing every day. We see it in the media now. Things are changing. 
but we need everyone in this room. Uh, we need to make this change together. And um, I hope you'll join me in making that change. So thank you. Thank you, Helen. This is very, very inspirational. You are just an amazing person, entrepreneur, great role model for our students, for all students across the country and the world. So thank you for thank being you. with us. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now Helen has graciously agreed to answer a few questions. So if there are any questions, I think we have a microphones here. And by the way, my first robots in the movies were lost in space because I'm a little bit older. <laughs> Bobby. <laughs> Helen, hi. I wanted to ask you, what did you find to be your biggest challenge in your career? Hmm. Oh, for, for my biggest challenge is I'm a natural introvert, right? I, before I went and I spoke, even to a small room of people at first, I would be physically sick every time. I'd go to the bathroom and throw up. But I found that I kept accepting the invitations. I never said no to you know, any of them that would um, help me get the message out. And after doing it for decades, <laughs> and um, before I had a three-year-old, I, um, you know, I used to travel all the time and speak. Um, so it doesn't come naturally to me, but I find if you work on it, and I, you know, my advice to everyone would be, if you're given a chance to speak, take it, even if you really, really don't want to do it, even if you really feel like it's not your thing, do it anyway, because you will get used to it, it will get better, and um, it's gonna help you get the word out about what you're doing. Uh, you know, you might think somebody's gonna notice. People in general don't notice. You have to do a little self-promotion. <laughs> Well, we're glad that you say yes. Thank you. Hi. Um, over here. Um, my name is Alyssa. I'm with the Wentworth Robotics Club, actually. So thank you for all that you do, because we really like doing it as well. Um, and I had a question about um, that passion that you were talking about. Was there ever a point where you um, felt so discouraged that you felt as if that you had lost a little bit of that passion and how did you get it back? Huh, there, was, there was one time that we had, we tried to put an internet connected robot on the market in 2000 and um, it, it turns out that we couldn't get the bill of sale down, the internet wasn't quite fast enough, People didn't have always on internet connections. And, you know, when that didn't work out and we'd already gone out and talked about everywhere, I thought, oh, this is, you know, we might be too, too ahead of our time. <laughs> um, but we had all this great stuff that was also going on at the company. And just being look around and talking to how excited the teams were, you know, we kept going at it and say, oh, okay, if this one doesn't work out now, that the next one will. So that was a, you know, a little bit of a low point for, for me before we had the Moomba on the market. Um, uh, you know, I think it was a time when the stocks were down and, you know, it was harder to get investment capital. Um, but, you know, we had, we, we always kind of could look back and say, we know robots are going to exist, right? They have to. It's a better way to get things done. And if we don't make it happen, you know, somebody else is going to. <laughs> Hi, um, I had a question. What would be your biggest piece of advice for women that are looking to start their own companies, whether it be small scale or as big as you've kind of had created your companies into. But what, what would be your number one tip or takeaway from starting your own company? For, uh, number one tip for what? Uh, starting your own company. Oh, starting your own company. I'd say sit down and write, not a business plan, but at least sit down and write out down a pitch and run it by people. Don't always listen to what they say because especially if they're from the industry you're in, you might have a better way of doing things. If you don't have something new, you know, I'm not sure, you, unless you're really well funded, I'm not sure you're going to make a good uh, company. But if you've got something new, a new way of doing things, whether it's a business process or a technology or what have you, um, sit down and write a pitch for it and run it by people and listen to them. But don't necessarily take it because they might be entrenched in the old way of doing things, but at least you will have heard it and you, um, you might gain something from it because of that industry expertise that they have. Like us listening that 
the most important thing when you put a consumer product in the market is price, you know, we could rationalize to ourselves, oh, people will just buy it at $5,000 or whatever, but that really wouldn't have worked. Now, people might buy robots in the future at that price, but you're going to have to build up to it rather than, um, you know, do, do it at the first. And, and listening to people in the consumer industry who already knew that, that, that was helpful. Hi, uh, my name is Marie, Marie Valentin. Uh, I've actually uh, recently completed like a, like a class, like a course on, uh, I mean a training I should say, on uh, programmable logic controllers. Yep. And I have developed a passion for that, you know, uh, cool. that stuff. And now what would be your best professional advice on my taking it to the next level? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a that that that's a tough one um, because I don't know what you what, what your experience is in the past um, or what program you're in. Oh, well, um, you know, yeah, I but I, I would give everyone the advice if you've got a real passion for something, look at opportunities to start a company around it. Um, you know, especially when you're um, you know just out of school, like some of you you know are, because if you do it when you're young. Um, you know, in this country, it's a badge of honor, right? If you go out and do it and it doesn't work out, you can, um, you know, dust yourself off. You might not have the family responsibilities, the mortgage, the, you know, all the stuff you have to worry about yet. Just try it out when you're young. And if it doesn't work out, you can go back and enter the, um, you know, the, the, the job market. So it could be leaving a company. It could be joining a, a, a team that has a company. Uh, I'm a big advocate for people just trying, trying it out. Um, and then, you know, maybe merging with a larger company. I think it's a pathway to get you further faster. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Robin Beauchamp. I'm the director of co-ops and careers here at Wentworth. And thank you very much, first of all, for hiring so many of our students and alumni. We are so appreciative of that. But you struck me when you said you uh, used to be that 23-year-old giving a speech. And I'm curious about uh, how, as a 23-year-old, you might have had that confidence and where you get that inspiration from if there's another person who has been your role model? Um, I, I was fortunate I did the Springboard program, which is um, a, um, a, 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 a trains women to um, make a pitch and go after venture capital. And what I learned from them originally is when I pitched, people thought we were much smaller than we were. And so having a little bit of coaching was good. And um, I have a mentor in the Boston area who, um, you know, helped me, you know, solidify how I spoke to people, um, which is, you know, maybe, like, I think it's good to have, you know, what you would call a personal board of directors, people that are, you know, there that you can count on to help you. That's different from the corporate advisory board. Uh, who might be more luminaries, or they might be people that are looking out for the entire corporation, uh, but people that are your board of directors, so you can run things by them, you know, should I do this, should I do that? Um, and I, it helps to have, a, you know, those sounding boards, so I would say everyone should start working on having their personal board of directors. Those people, you can make it official, or you can just make it, you know, they're just confidants that you talk to, but people that have kind of been there, done that, that you can ask for, advice and you know again even if you don't take it it's always good to listen <laughs> thank you very much helen we all appreciate your inspirational thank you. I appreciate words it. before we conclude the speaking part of today's wonderful event we have a special treat two students on campus Tyler Springetti and Olivia DeLuca have produced a video for today's program. We're pleased to be able to share their amazing work with you this morning. Let's enjoy this video. Women at Wentworth are valued, powerful, amazing. Women at Wentworth are the future. The 20% ratio doesn't limit my opportunities. The 20% ratio doesn't matter. The 20% ratio makes me work harder. The 20% ratio is just one number that describes female students at Vanport. The 20% ratio isn't intimidating at all. The 20% ratio gives 110% of themselves to make our campus amazing. 
I am successful because of my supportive family. I am successful because of my passion for design. I am successful because I take advantage of all the opportunities here at WIT, whether it be sports teams, extracurricular activities, leadership positions, all of those really help shape your college experience. I am here to support and guide. I am a designer. I am a mechanical engineer. A interdisciplinary engineer. I am a biomedical engineer. I am a designer. I am an architect. We are industrial designers. I am full of Dean love for Wentworth students. I want to inspire others. I want to be a shoe designer. I want to encourage more alumni to be engaged with the university. I want to change the world through sustainable design. I want to change the world in healthcare. I want to see Wentworth be 50% women. That was incredible. Can Olivia and Tyler please stand if they're here? Well, everyone, we've come to the end of our exciting morning, um, but that doesn't mean you have to leave. So I encourage everyone to stay, chat, form new friendships, build new networks, enjoy the day, enjoy the sunshine. Uh, apparently the storm has gone back out to sea, so let's hope it stays that way. Have a happy St. Patrick's Day, and thank you for spending your morning with us. And thanks to the organizers. This was an incredible event.